just want to welcome you once again to the revival train, the train that is destined to go to heaven. And I'm really believing today that God is going to speak to you very, very especially. I really want to address those people who feel that they have got nothing to offer God. You might not be a um, accredited uh, pastor or a preacher or a minister. You might not be in full-time ministry, but I want to tell you something now. God needs you. I am firmly convinced that in these last days, and we are believing for the greatest revival that the world has ever seen, God is going to use, wait for it, ordinary people. That's right, people like you and I. I'm talking about housewives, farmers, businessmen, sportsmen, university students, old age pensioners. God is on the move and He's looking for you today. Are you ready? I really want you to understand one thing. Right through the Bible, from Genesis right through to Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ has used ordinary people. Let's start right at the beginning with Abraham. What was he? He was a farmer. That's right. What was Paul the apostle? In my opinion, the greatest apostle in the Bible. He was a tent maker. Folks, you don't hear about priests. Now, by the way, I'm a preacher, so I'm not knocking any preachers. But what the Holy Spirit is telling me today is that he is calling ordinary people to do his work, to bring in the largest harvest that the world has ever seen. Now, if you have your agricultural manual, there it is. If you've got your agricultural manual with you, I want you to turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27, and I'm going to read from verse 57. Now, when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. Then Joseph, when he had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Joseph of Arimathea was a businessman. He was not a preacher. He was not even one of the 12 disciples. He was a secret disciple, but he wasn't one of the 12 disciples. He wasn't one of the big names. That's right. In fact, you never hear about him again. And yet he is mentioned in all four gospels. Isn't that amazing? Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, I'm talking to some Josephs now, and some of you are ladies, some of you are young people. The Lord is calling the Josephs. He's calling the businessmen and the businesswomen, and he's saying, it's time, I want to use you. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the council. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the governing body of Israel in those days. Do you know that the Sanhedrin had the authority to send a man to death if necessary? They had the ultimate authority. And Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin. And yet that man went to Pontius Pilate and he could have lost his life for doing that because when he asked for the body of Jesus, he exposed himself. And Pontius Pilate gave him the body of our Savior. So he took a risk that the disciples didn't take. Where were the disciples? They'd run away. That's right. The, the one, the leader of the disciples was the one who said, I'll, I'll never deny you, Lord. He said, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. But we know that the Lord restored Peter after that, didn't he? And he became the head of the church. But up until then, it took an ordinary man, a businessman, to take the body of the Savior off the cross to take money out of his own pocket, that's right, okay? Take money out of his own pocket and buy expensive linen and a hundred pounds, that's 50 kilos, 50 kilos of herbs, special herbs, okay? To embalm the body of Jesus and then take the body of Jesus to his own tomb. 
that he had carved out of rock. I've been there. By the way, the tomb is empty. And that's good news, isn't it? But that tomb would have cost a fortune to make, a brand new tomb. Joseph gave that tomb for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something now, folks. We really need to put our hands in our pockets and we need to get practical and we need to get real because God is looking for men who are not just talking, but doers of the word. In fact, if you look at James chapter 1 and verse 22, the Bible tells us to be doers of the word. You see, Joseph of Arimathea put his money where his mouth was. Excuse the pun. These men and women of God are worth their weight in gold. I don't know how many men I've met. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, brother. I've got a scripture for you. And that's okay too, but that's where it stops. <laughs> There's nothing else after that. And when we are organizing some of the biggest meetings that we've ever had, I think some of the biggest meetings that the world's ever seen, we've had over 400,000 men on this farm, on this farm. And I want to tell you something now. We need scripture, of course, and we need prayer, and especially intercessors. They're top of the list. But we also need businessmen. We need practical men who are prepared to put their hands in their pockets and to deliver. Words are cheap, but it's action that God is talking about here in James chapter 1 and verse 22. And in case any of you are sitting there and saying, Angus, are you telling us we have to work our way to heaven? Not at all. But I want to tell you something now. Joseph of Arimathea, you will see him in heaven. Okay? Nobody saw him here because he didn't want to be identified. He just got on with the job. But when you get to heaven, I can tell you right now, you will see Joseph of Arimathea because you'll be right in the front line. You see, he was a quiet man. He was a man who just got on with the job. No noise, no fanfare. He was a worker. He didn't even want to be noticed by anybody. But he had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he put his money and his effort where his mouth was. Men and women need to understand something, folks. It's doers that God's looking for. You know, I know a man, I won't mention his name because he won't appreciate that. He dug all the toilets for the Mighty Men Conference, not one, a number we had on this farm, but particularly in 2010, when we had, we can't, we can't tell you exactly how many men because we didn't sell tickets and we didn't take a collection. But we are talking about between 400 and 450,000 men. Men, not people. That is quite something. You go to the average church and what do you see? You see lots of women and children and praise God for that. You don't always see lots of men. But in this case, it was men only. And what we did was we dug toilets. What we call in South Africa a long drop. In other words, it's like an outhouse, you'd say, in America. It's a hole in the ground. And then we just put a cover over the top of it. He had trenches that he dug with machinery and workers. This man had enough toilets to service for a full weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And some, of course, came days before and they left days later for almost half a million men. Do you know his name? I do, and Jesus does, which is more important. I want to tell you about a young man that lives in the eastern part of our country. This man's not even 30 years old. Well, he wasn't then. He put one million rand into the account for one of the prayer meetings, national prayer meetings that we had. One million. And you know something? He never told anybody. His own father didn't know about it until later. That is a Joseph of Arimathea. We need to get a wake-up call, all of us, and we need to stop making excuses. Yeah, well, you know, Angus, you know, I'm, I'm on the pension now, you know. I mean, I've got to look after myself, really. What about allowing God to look after you? I want to tell you something now. It's the best insurance policy I've ever had in my life, and I don't do it for any other reason but because I love Jesus Christ. The more I give to God, the more He gives back to me, and He does it in the most peculiar ways and ways that I've never dreamt of. I want to tell you the best investment you'll ever have is to get involved with the work of God like Joseph of Arimathea did. We need to be men of significance. I want to tell you about two old ladies. They've since gone to be with Jesus. They're already there. These two old ladies were pensioners. They were over 70 years old in those days. They used to travel with me all over the country. 
and outside the country. What were they? They were intercessors. They would sit at the back of the hall. They would sit somewhere in the stadium where nobody saw them and they would pray for me for years and years. And I really want to tell you that even today, you need to do that. You need to say, oh Lord, what have I got? That little boy said, I've got two fishes and I've got five barley loaves of bread and I'm going to give them to Jesus. You're going to tell me out of 5,000 men that not one of those men had any food? Of course they did. They just didn't want to share it, did they? But that little boy, you'll meet him in heaven. Oh yes, I'm looking forward to shaking him by the hand. He said, Jesus, I've only got what my mom gave me for breakfast. And Jesus said, that's quite sufficient. And he took it and he multiplied it. It's a story of my life. That's what I've been doing since I was born again. I kept saying, Lord, I, I can't speak very well. And he says, but I can. Lord, I don't have any education. He says, but I've got all the wisdom you need. But Lord, I don't have any money. He says, I've got all the money that you ever will need. Don't, you don't even have to ask for a cent, and I never have. I want to tell you, God is looking for ordinary people. I want to tell you three stories, true stories, about three ordinary men. In fact, we've made a movie of it called Ordinary People. And the first one is a black man from Cape Town, a hijacker. What's a hijacker? Maybe you don't understand where you live what a hijacker is. It's somebody that takes your car by force. There were two men that were coming to one of these conferences, these men's conferences, all the way from Cape Town. That's a, over a thousand kilometers away. And the one man was driving to pick up his friend, and he stopped. And a man st stepped out of the darkness with a revolver. And he said, I want the car. And this guy didn't want to give him the car, and he shot it at him, and he missed him. But he picked the wrong man, because this is a huge ex-policeman. He got out of the car, and he overpowered the hijacker. And he took the revolver from him, and he tried to shoot the hijacker in the head out of frustration and anger and whatever you want to call, call it. But the gun didn't go off. Then eventually he handcuffed him and put him in the back of the pickup. <laughs> It was a double cab, right? And then he drove to his friend. And it's in the movie. And it's true. And when he picked up his friend, his friend said, who's that in the back? He says, that's a hijacker. What are you going to do? Take him to the police station. He said, no, I'm taking him to the Mighty Men Conference. <laughs> that man got saved. An ordinary man. The last I heard, he's, he's back in Kailicha in Cape Town. And he's an evangelist. That's right, the hijacker. I want to tell you that God uses ordinary people. The next guy was a youngster that was totally off the rails. He had just systematically destroyed his father's vehicles. Every time his dad bought him a car, he got drunk and got drugged up and then had a crash. His dad didn't know what to do with him anymore. I met that young man. They brought him to the Mighty Men Conference and God transformed his life. The last man was a man on a motorbike, a huge, big road motorbike. This man came to the meeting. He was in an absolute state. He'd come all the way from the Free State, which is about a thousand kilometers west of where we are. And he'd come there, and there was divorce in the air, and his family was dis, uh, disjointed, and it was a complete mess up. On the Saturday night, that man had an encounter with God. And he phoned his wife and he phoned his family. He asked forgiveness. He said, I want to start a new life. He says, I'm coming home tomorrow. Call the family together. But what he didn't realize, that was his last day on earth. Because the next morning, he never even came to the last service that we had on the farm. He got on his motorbike and he started going home. He was so excited to meet with his family. And not far from here, his motorbike got out of control, hit a pothole, and the bike went over and killed him. I've met his family. That incident brought his family together. God is the God of the ordinary person. Yes, he's the God that divides the Red Sea. He's the God that raises the dead. He's the God that changes the weather. That's right. But he's also the God of the whosoevers. And that's what I want to speak to you about today. I want to ask you a serious question, sir. 
Are you bent on success or are you bent on significance? I've just read a book by Bob Beaufort who's since gone to be with the Lord. When he talks about coming of age, basically, he says, what are you chasing? Are you chasing success? What is success, Angus? Well, success is making money, right? It's success is getting established. Success is fame. It's fortune. It's all about self. Now, when a young man leaves school, that's normally what he does, or a young woman. They want to make a name for themselves. They want to get their own house. They want to get their own car. They want to get their own, own, own. All about own. But when they come to half time, I'm talking about 40 years old and over, things change. And they start realizing these things that I'm chasing are plastic. They have no value, really. Chasing the wind. Who said that? The, rich, the wisest and the richest man who ever lived. What was his name? His name was Solomon. You can go and read it in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, chasing the wind. You know, they reckon that they did a calculation that Solomon was richer than any man that has ever lived. And that's including Bill Gates and all the rest of them. They, did a, they worked it out. The richest man that ever lived, the wisest man that ever lived. Remember the story of the two women, the two prostitutes who had a baby. Each one had a little baby boy within days of each other. Remember that story? The one woman lay on top of her baby at night, didn't she? And she suffocated the baby. She got up in the middle of the night and she changed the babies over. And she took the live baby and, and her dead baby she gave to the other woman. The other woman woke up in the morning to find that there was a dead baby. She was horrified. She had a closer look and she realized, that's not my baby. This other lady has stolen my baby. They went to see the wisest man in the world. His name is Solomon. They said to Solomon, by the way, Solomon wasn't a priest either, was he? No. He was a man that met with God. He's a man that had a dream. And in his dream, the Lord said, you're a good man, Solomon. I'll give you anything you want. He said, Lord, give me wisdom. Maybe there's a word for somebody watching this program. You need wisdom. That's what you need. You don't need anything else, just wisdom. You don't need money. You don't need status. You don't need fame. You don't need physical strength. You need wisdom. And God said, because you've asked correctly, I'm going to give you wisdom and everything else. I was reading this morning how much he, he owned. It was incredible. He had 12 governors. Each governor in Israel had to feed his palace for one month. You have no idea. I'm a farmer. Hundreds and hundreds of oxen were slaughtered every day just to feed Solomon's household. He had something like, I don't know if it was 40,000 horses. Folks, we've got about 10 horses on this farm. <laughs> Can you imagine? Anyway, there, you go and look it up there. You go and read it in 1 Kings. Incredible. So these two women came to the wisest man on earth. And they said, we want you to tell us, this baby that's alive, who's the mother? So Solomon looked at the situation and he said to one of his men, Bring me a sharp sword. And the two ladies said, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to cut the baby in half. And I'll give you a half each, and then you'll both be happy. The woman who had the dead child said, that's very fair. I think that's only the, the right way to do it. But the real mother of the baby said, please don't do that, sir. Give her my baby. And then Solomon said, there is the real mother. That is wisdom. Okay, that is unbelievable wisdom. Who else would have thought to do something like that? It's because God uses people whose hearts are completely sold out for Him. Now, I want to say to you that these men that came to the, uh, these Mighty Men conferences were ordinary people, ordinary men. I remember when we had the biggest tent in the world in 2008, the commander of the South African army was here. He was just sitting there with all the rest of the crowd. We've had all kinds of people coming here from all over. We had a delegation of 80 farmers coming from Australia, unannounced. Folks, I want to tell you now that God is no respecter of persons. He told me a simple thing. He said, I want you to mentor young men. I thought maybe five or ten. 
we are talking about a potential army. There was more men on this farm than the South African Defense Force put together, Army, Air Force, and the Navy. Because God uses ordinary people. So that man that I'm talking about, the wisest man, the richest man, what did he say about success? He said, vanity, vanity. It's like chasing the wind. He says, it's all like, it's like, it's like, it's like plastic. You know, this book that I'm reading, this man used such a beautiful analogy, which I want to share with you. And this is how it goes. He says, have you ever been to a, a greyhound dog race? Okay, where they race dogs like you race horses in a circuit. And what they do, they have a plastic uh, hair, a plastic rabbit. Okay, and this thing goes right around the circuit and the dogs chase the hare. And of course, when they come through the finish line, the first through is the winner. He said, but sometimes that mechanical hare breaks down and in the middle of the race, it stops and the greyhound dogs catch up to the hare. And what do they do? They don't know what to do. Apparently, they just run around this plastic hare. They don't know what to do with it because it's plastic. I want to tell you something now, success. Sometimes I'm talking particularly to young men. You are striving, you're going for it, you're running the race of your life, and when you get it, you get so disappointed, don't you? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 36. This is what I'm trying to say to you. Folks, we haven't got time to waste chasing plastic rabbits we've got to become significant now what's the difference between success and significance well this is what bob Beaufort says significance is about one word and i want you to write it down it's called relationships that's what it is it's all about people it's about looking after people about taking care of people do you remember the story of francis of assisi francis of assisi it's a true story he went to Israel. He was a crusader. His father was a very wealthy cloth merchant. He had all the armor and he had the big cross and he went there and made an absolute hash up like all those crusaders did, doing the wrong thing. When he came back, he was so disenchanted with these things of life that he took everything off. There's a movie made about it called Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, where he stands absolutely naked in front of his father and the whole village. He says, I don't want any more. You say he was an extremist. Maybe he was. But I tell you what, he saw the light. He took off everything that he had. And he said to his father, I owe you nothing more. His father was absolutely devastated. And he walked out into the bush. And he found a broken down monastery. And he rebuilt it by hand. Francis of Assisi. And he started taking care of the poor and the needy and the mentally challenged, and the physically challenged. And that was his life. He found purpose. You and I need to understand, we might be ordinary people, but we serve an extraordinary God. And He's calling you today. He's saying, step up to the next level. It's not all about you. It's all about Him. And when we find our purpose in life, then we find life in abundance. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give you life abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10. I want to say to you today, I am living my dream. That's right. You know how many men, when they go to retirement, some of them don't even last two years. And I'm talking about men of essence, men of gifting, men of talent, CEOs of large companies. They say, next year I'm retiring. I've got a little beach cottage down by the coast. I'm going to go and fish. I'm going to take it easy. I'm just going to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Within three weeks, that man is tired of fishing. And he's got nothing to get up for in the morning if he's got no vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And I don't know how many I've heard. Within two years, they die. They die from the inside outwards. You've got to have a vision. And it's got to be not success orientated. It's got to be significance orientated. 
You've got to be a person of significance. And what is that? To be a servant of the Lord like Joseph of Arimathea. You don't read about one sermon that he preached. You don't hear about him having one crusade, one campaign, one movie, one book, nothing. What did he do? He used what he had. You know, faith has got feet. See these cowboy boots of mine? This is, these are feet. Faith has got feet. It's a doing word. And you and I need to do that. We need to start becoming significant. Mother Teresa. Everybody knows who Mother Teresa is. Is that right? That's right. Everybody. You know that she was very, very well uh, a set. She was in a convent in Calcutta, a very upmarket type convent. She, I think she might have even been the principal. I can't remember. So she had her life all marked out. And then one day the Holy Spirit started speaking to her and telling her there are people in the gutter that are dying. There are people in the street that no one even loves. Go and help them. And as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. She left the sheltered convent that she was living in, and she went out into the streets. And it wasn't easy. It was very hard. What did she actually do? Did she become a great preacher? No. Did she become a great entrepreneur? No. What did she do? I'll tell you what she did. She went and she took people out of the gutter that were dying. Some of these men would say to her, why are you touching me? Because his body was, was moving with maggots. And that's the honest truth. She said, because Jesus loves you. And she would touch them. And they would take that body and they would wash that man or that old woman. And they would put them in between two clean sheets. And let them die with dignity. That's all she did. Do you know any other woman in the world that's more famous than Mother Teresa? No. Because she had realized it's not about success. It's about significance. So what do you have to do? The same as what I did. You have to find out what is it, Lord, that you want me to do with the rest of my life. That's all. I went to the Mkuzi Game Reserve. You know the story. I've told you a hundred times. Just north of our farm, Shalom. I went there for a rest. I was very tired. I'd been preaching all over. I'd come of age. I was so excited. I felt that I had become a successful preacher. I was invited to go to Newfoundland. I don't know where that is. <laughs> I do now, but I didn't then. That's the truth. I'd been invited to go to India, funny enough. And I'd had it all worked out. My preaching plan was organized for the whole year, completely. All my appointments. I couldn't cope. I was in demand. And I went and sat there, and I was quite smug. Lord, I am working for you. My boys are running the farm. We've got a children's home on the farm. We've got a church on the farm. Everything's working well, Lord. And I sat there and I was reading my Bible systematically. And hopefully you do the same. What does that mean? Well, it means I wasn't jumping around. I just read the Bible and I got to the book of Revelation. I've got it outlined in my Bible here. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. And the Lord Jesus said, and I tell you what, folks, I've never heard God speak to me audibly. Never. Not many have, by the way, and have lived to tell the tale. He's an awesome God. Moses spoke with God on Mount Sinai and had to wear a veil over his face for three weeks. So when a guy says to you, God speaks to me regularly, I think you need to challenge that man. I have never had that privilege. I would be too afraid. But he spoke to me in my heart, and he spoke to me through this word. And this is what he said. He said, nevertheless, after I've just been telling him all the wonderful things I'm doing for him. Nevertheless, Angus, I have this against you. Now, straight away, I, I sat up. Lord, against me? You have left your first love. Whoa, folks, I think I broke out crying. Lord? He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. What does that mean? Change. Stop doing what you're doing. And do the first works. What were the first works, Lord? Well, you used to have quiet times with me every day, Angus, remember? You used to walk with me every day. You used to go up the mountains, the mighty Drakensberg Mountains, with a bucket of water, and you used to fast and pray. He says, remember those days. You, you used to spend time in my word. You used to spend time communing with me. So the Lord says, repent and do the first works. Now listen to this. 
This is quite scary. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I want to tell you something, folks. That lampstand that we are talking about is the Holy Spirit because He is the light of the world. Can you, you know, for me, everybody's got a, like a, a picture of a nightmare. Eh? You, you know what I'm talking about? You're dreaming. There's a man-eating lion chasing after you. You're running as fast as you can. And he's just about to bite you and you wake up in a cold sweat. That's a nightmare. For me, a nightmare is to get on a platform and look at tens of thousands of people and the Holy Spirit says, I'm not there, I'm leaving. That is a nightmare because I have no natural abilities. I'm not a natural speaker. I'm not a musician. I'm not an artist of any kind. I'm just a farmer, an ordinary person. Well, I was devastated. What must I do, Lord? And I felt the Lord say, go home. Number one, cancel everything. I'm saying, Lord, come on. He says, everything. Now, some of those people had booked me two years in advance. Some of them had already even started doing the advertising. It cost money. Cancel everything. And then what do I do, Lord? Because the boys are doing the farming, my sons, what do I do? I want you to mentor young men. That's all. Well, I went home after really, really repenting. I'm so sorry, Lord. I missed it. I was chasing success instead of significance. And I picked up the phone. And you know, the first miracle happened. I want to tell you, when you're obedient to God, that's when miracles happen. I really want you to know that. I want you to write that down. When you are obedient to God, that's when miracles start happening. Real miracles. The first miracle was, I started to phone all these people that had booked me. Not one single man was disappointed. I was shocked. Not one of them was angry. They said, Angus, if God has told you not to come, we don't want you. God bless you. Maybe we'll see you later. That was the first miracle. The second miracle was the Lord said to me, in my heart, write an email, one liner, just one sentence, and inviting young men to come to this farm for a meeting. Well, I thought I was expecting seven or eight men, maybe 10. 240 men came. That was the birth of the mighty men phenomenon that is going right around the world today. And in 2010, as I said earlier on, we had over 400,000 men here. I remember when we had the big tent, we had 60,000 men. We fed them for a whole weekend. Can you believe that? Do you know that we killed 40 oxen? Not young winners, oxen. 40 for one meal. <laughs> we never charged the guys a penny. It was for free. We fed them the whole weekend. I want to close now. I want to pray for you. Because I really believe that there are some Joseph of Arimathea's, men and women, that are sitting there and saying, what can I do to be part of the greatest revival that the world's ever going to see? Because Jesus is not coming soon. He's on his way. We know that. Everybody is talking about it. So I'm talking about the coming of the Lord. Now, when he comes, you need to be hard at work, folks. Not sitting there counting your pennies. Because I want to tell you, sir, not one of those pennies are going to heaven with you. You're going home the same way you came in, with nothing. The only thing you can take to heaven with you is your family, your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors. It's the only thing you'll take to heaven. And what God's going to ask you when he gets to heaven, he's going to say, where are your family that I gave you? No, no, but Lord, you know, I started the biggest organization and I, the Lord's saying, I'm not interested. Where are the people I gave you? That is being significant. It's called relationships, and it's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Especially starting in your own family. I know, I'm a family man. So I want to say to you today, you need to start putting your faith into action. Don't tell people that you love them. Show them that you love them. How? by what you do for them. It's got nothing to do with earning your way to heaven. No, nobody knows that better than me. We've been saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, for it was a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. So in conclusion, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will give you the strength to get going. To get going, what can you do? Well, what have you got? 
That's what Moses said. Lord, what can I do? I've got nothing. I've lost everything. He said, what do you got in your hand? I've got a stick. He says, that is sufficient. Use that. But Lord, I can't speak. I stutter. He said, don't worry. He says, Aaron's on his way and he'll help you. And by the way, Aaron never got a chance to speak. <laughs> I want to say to you today that faith begets faith. So get around faithful men and women. If you told me when I started off with those 240 men that one day I would be speaking to hundreds of thousands of men, I would have laughed you in the face. You see, the campaigns would have been all right. If I had said, Lord, I'm not doing that when I was in the game reserve, I'm going to carry on with, the, with our crusades all over the world. It would have been fine. The word of God never returns void. But I would have never seen the miracle working power of a living God. The prayer meetings that we've had in this nation, the stadiums that we've had, the movies, the books, it's all God. It's called significance, but He wants to test you. And maybe for some of you, you've got to lay it down, sir. You're so busy with your business that your family don't even know you. I've spoken to young boys sometimes and young girls. I remember a man telling me, and this is, I'm not getting personal here, but maybe I am. A young boy, I used to have a coffee bar when I used to look after, the, uh, take care of the young people on a Friday night when I was first a Christian. And these guys would come home from boarding school. And in front of their dads, they'd say, hey, we love it. We love boarding school because my dad went there, my granddad and my great-granddad. And then I would take the boy aside on his own. And I'd say, son, do you like leaving home? And he'd say, no, sir. And tears would well up in his eyes. Well, why are you doing it? Because that's what my mom and dad want me to do. I want to say to you, you need to get back to basics. If your boy wants to come home, let him come home. He's only at home for a few years. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. That big business. Ask your son, would you rather see more of me or would you rather me develop a business so that you can have your own ski boat and you can have your own motorbike and you can have your... Eh? I want time with you, dad. So you need to understand that. These are the things of significance I'm talking about. What about your wife? When does she ever see you? No, but Angus, I'm doing this for the family. You're a liar, sir. And the truth is not in you. And why am I saying that? Because that was me. See, when people used to drive onto this farm, I wanted the fences to be straight, the cattle to be fat, the maize had to be tall, no weeds underneath. And Joe would say, Angus, where have you been? The kids are sleeping. And when you left this morning, they were sleeping. They never see you. And I used to get cross with them. I'd say, Jill, I'm doing this for you and the kids. Lies. I was doing it for my own ego. Success. My own acceptance in the district. I've got the most improved farm of the year. So what? So what? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his family? So I want to say to you now, I'm going to pray for you, that God will speak to you, not just to businessmen, and not just to men, to women as well. Oh, yes. I've seen these ladies. I've seen them at the departure lounges in some of the big airports. I don't know what time you get up, madam. You look fantastic in your business outfit. I've got no problem with that. There's a lot of single mothers watching this program, and I understand you have to put food on the table, but you need to really count the cost. You left home before your children woke up. Oh, well, I've got a carer. She comes in. Your kids want you, not the carer. So work it out. Adjust it. And then God will undertake for you. If I had said, no, Lord, I'm doing my own thing. I'm just going to be a preacher for you. And I'm going to carry on being an evangelist. He would have used somebody else. But I didn't. I listened. I went home. And I adjusted the situation. And the rest is history. Joseph of Arimathea at the cost of his life, went to Herod. Herod could have had him crucified as well, but he didn't. He took the risk. It's called faith. And God did the rest. So I'm going to pray for you now, and I'm going to pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will really speak into your life. I want to speak also to people that are on pension. You know something? There's no such word as retirement in heaven. Only promotion. Okay? Caleb was 85 years old. 85! When Joshua said, you can have any part that you want. You've done so well. 
He said, give me the big mountains where the big giants are. As one guy said in that book, he said, when I die, I want to go home swinging. <laughs> swinging. That's how I want to go home. Not sitting in a corner waiting to die. I want to go home with blood all over me in the middle of the battle. Don't you want to do that? That's what I want to do. I want to be a brave heart for Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm praying for these beautiful people watching this program, ordinary people. And I know some of them maybe have felt a bit that I was picking on them. I, I wasn't picking on them, Lord, because I don't know them. Maybe you're picking on them. Maybe they need to lay down something so that you can give them something else. Lord, you can't give a man something when his hand is full. Maybe he needs to lay, lay it down. Sit down, have a team talk with his family after this program. What do you want me to do? I want you to downscale so that you can spend time with the family. Then do it. I want you to maybe leave that company now and start working for something that has significance because this life is but a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. I pray most of all, Lord, for fulfillment, for peace of mind, and that these precious people can be like I am, Lord, living their dream. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, until the next time on the revival train, may God bless you. And remember, there's only one way, and that's forward. God bless you and goodbye.